I'm Julie Pace, Washington Bureau Chief for the Associated Press, and this is Ground Game. The coronavirus pandemic ranks among one of the most consequential stories ever covered by the Associated Press in its 170-year history. Here to take you inside the outbreak is AP's Ralph Russo. From the Associated Press, this is Inside the Outbreak. I'm Ralph Russo. Today is Tuesday, April 14th. Around the world, leaders are examining ways to lift social distancing restrictions while also guarding against reigniting the coronavirus outbreak. In Europe, a contract tracing app is being jointly developed by several countries in the hope of being able to contain the spread of the virus when it's under control. In the United States, the governors of Washington, Oregon, and California have formed a coalition to figure out how to reopen economies. And in the Northeast, seven states from Rhode Island to Delaware have announced a similar collaboration. Today on Inside the Outbreak, we'll talk with AP photojournalist Wang Mei and photo editor Enrique Marti. With a motorcycle and a camera, Mei and Enrique captured the eerie beauty of emptiness in 12 rides around New York with the city on lockdown. In an essay of videos and photos, Mei and Enrique shot restaurants closed, taxis lined up parked unoccupied, wide highways unusually wide open, people alone where crowds normally should be. If you go to APNews.com, you can find their work under the headline, Ghostly Virus Era New York Captured from a Motorbike. Joining me today on the podcast is Mei Yi Wang, a photojournalist for the AP, and photo editor Enrique Marti. Thank you very much for joining me. Really looking forward to talking about your project. Yeah, nice. Thanks for having us. So give me the idea of what the genesis of this was, Uh, the idea of, you know, I'm sure you're trying to figure out how best to chronicle what's going on in New York. And there's some challenges about, you know, photographing people up close. So tell the people what you did and how you came up with this project of, again, trying to chronicle the silence of New York to a certain degree. Well, the idea, I mean, I've been driving a motorcycle in every city that I live since from, from for many years. I always had the same kind of motorcycle. And uh, I lived in, in, in Jerusalem, in Cairo, in Mexico. You know, by driving, I always saw I'm a still photographer, not a video. You, my idea was that I was seeing still photos all the time that I could never take. So what happened here is that me and I went, when the, at the beginning of this, on, on, I think it was on the 15th, we, we went to, you know, I went with her to downtown Manhattan with a motorcycle, for her to go take pictures of Times Square. I don't know what it was, okay. And while we were driving, she was actually taking pictures while we were driving or or asking me to stop because she saw a picture and so on. And then talking about it, we, we thought, well, why don't we do a drive-by uh, story in New York with pictures taken from the motorcycle? And we spoke about it and we, you know, uh, agreed on the concept and how it was going to be that, we had, you know, she had to embrace the fact that she was in the motorcycle, that uh, you couldn't, we couldn't stop, okay, because the drive-by photos are drive-by, okay, and the pictures were going to be while riding or, you know, if we were stopped in a, in a traffic light, okay. So, yeah, that's, uh, and we thought it could be a cool and different way of documenting the, the city and what the, the city was going through. If I can add a little bit to this is that I think we were also finding ways to move around safely around New York City. The idea came about as well because we were trying to avoid taking public transport if we could. And and Enrique happened to own a motorcycle. So we were like, why don't we go ride around and take a look at what's around us? And eventually we realized that the motorcycle does cut down a lot of our travel time from getting from point A to B to C. And we did go to many places. It started off in Brooklyn because that's where we both live. But we can go into Manhattan, Queens, Harlem, Bronx. And it did save us a lot of time. And it was open air. So it's easy to see things around us. For me, personally, I've always worked a lot in North Korea and a lot of, for about five years. And a lot of my photo taking did happen 
in a vehicle out the window because it was one of the methods which I used to capture stolen moments, basically. It was just a, a quick way to see life pass you by. And I think a lot of us like to look out the window of a car when we're, when we're traveling on a road trip. The difference is we like to take photos as well. So that's kind of how it came together. It would be safe and fast. So if I could ask you one follow-up there, me photographers often find themselves on in physically challenging situations trying to get their shots. Any nervousness about being on the back of a bike? I'm sure Enrique is a great driver, but nonetheless, when you're when your hands are on a camera, that means they're not wrapped around the person in front of you or holding on to the bike. So was there any physical challenges or nervousness about, you know, riding around the bike and, and, and being able to take these pictures without falling off? Yes, 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 and a no and a maybe. So okay. <laughs> let me start off by saying that, first of all, I think it's in nature of journalists to, when there's a burning house, people run away from it. And for us, we tend to run towards it. And that is also partly because we're semi-crazy, but and it's in our character, but it's also what the job needs us to do. And I think it's very important what you brought up about us being very cognizant of our situation and the dangers around us and try to protect ourselves and make wise decisions and take calculated risks, right? You know, we protect ourselves with masks, gloves, we keep our distance, all the common sense things that we're supposed to do. Regarding the bike right? yes, it is, Enrique is a very safe driver. He is not young and he's been riding a bike all his life. And I say that with respect. But it does get pretty scary because I can't hold on to the handrails. I have camera in hand. And when you're trying to see take photos, you usually have to shoot it sideways. So I'm kind of switching my left kidney with my right, twisting my body, but trying not to fall off. I think it's a lot of unspoken trust that you have with each other. But physically, it is challenging. The roads in New York aren't all smooth depending on where you are. There have been instances where I have been airborne a little bit, but thank God I landed back on the seat. And Enrique isn't speeding because in order, if you speed, you can't take photos. It's, it's easy to go faster because the roads are empty during this time. I think the one thing that helps for me is to look ahead and anticipate the shot and then shoot it. There's a saying where if you see it, it means you missed it. So it's a lot of anticipation, balance, and it's a bit intuitive. but Everything at calculated risk. But if I may add also, I was normally not going too fast. And second, I will sometimes also see something and slow down, you see. And, and I didn't even have to speak with Mei. When I slow down, it's because I saw something that may be interesting. And, and, and she would have seen the same thing and shoot it. There was a picture that, that we both love, actually, which is one where there is a horse in front of a pharmacy, the empty street and the bicycle. And it was a really nice light and all the shops are closed. And this was in, in Queens, I think. And I, I really slowed down and I didn't say anything. And then I stopped like 40 meters ahead in the traffic light. And I just asked, you got the horse, right? She just said, yes. I guess that's the advantage of having a driver that is also a photographer. There is cases in which I didn't see the photo and then I was actually going pretty fast. There's a guy sitting there without a shirt, and it looks like he's going to jump. Like he didn't jump, but that's the impression you get. And that was almost like a highway, and I was going pretty fast, and I didn't see him. And she she got the picture, and you can tell that I was fast because it's a bit blurred, you see. So, And I drove in Mexico and in Cairo and many places, so I, I, I'm pretty good at it. I do love visual and a lot of these photo, photos of the blurs, right? The, the idea that you can tell that the photos were taken in motion. Let me ask you, and you can start with Enrique. What was the story you were trying to tell? What was the theme, of, the theme that you were trying to illustrate with these photos? What we agreed on is we were going to document with the city is going, I mean, there is empty streets, but not so empty, and try to catch these, you know, what Mei was saying, these stolen moments that relate the, 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 the situation in, in times of the coronavirus here. It's, uh, uh, I mean, we could have done this any time, drive-by photos in New York, and it would have been interesting also. But on top of it, we're documenting it when global strong story is going on, 
and we have the backdrop of a city that everybody knows, and we wanted to put it visually <clears throat> in the context. I mean, we're both, we're not from New York, okay? For both of us, New York is a little bit what we've seen in the movies and the music that we've been hearing. You know, we just wanted to to, to have some little, little creative leeway here to document the story that is going on now with in the backdrop of a place like New York City. No, excellent. Is there anything you would like to add, May? I think... There are a couple of things that were going through my mind as we were approaching this project. And and what we do is we've gone out for about 12 or 13 times on separate days to capture photos. And every day we would come back, I would download the images and we would share it with each other through WeTransfer. And we kind of digest and process and talk about it. So we're we're editing and curating this gallery along the way as we go. And your thoughts change as you see photos. You know, a story comes together and you start to put the pieces together. I think initially when we go out, what we plan to do is capture the mood, right? There's this thing that everyone's talking about. There's a mood. It's very grim. It's quiet. And when we talk about that, we often talk about it based on how we associate a place. For us, as Enrique said, New York City was all about movie sets because that's how we were introduced. I'm from Singapore, and he's from Barcelona. The familiarity comes from iconic shows, you know, Taxi, Sex in the City, and you have set scenes in your head. But to go around and see it empty is very surreal, and it almost became like another movie set, except that it's a movie that you don't want it. You wish it was really just a movie. And for us, it was to capture the mood. As we went along and we were editing the photos, I started to realize that, hey, we have to make sure that this, that it just doesn't look like New York after hours. You know, anyone can do that at five o'clock in the morning in front of a shop that is, you know, shuttered closed. It was very difficult, but challenging and, and interesting to try to balance that with the mood of coronavirus, whether People are wearing masks, you know, capture haunted looks of people. And a lot of them did look like they were running away from something. You know, you would have people standing at the traffic light looking like they're uncomfortable to be standing around each other. They want to walk away. It's like they have to hurry somewhere and they're running away from something that you can't see. So there is this haunted mood and images that I wanted to catch. At the same time, it's not all not doom and gloom. And we wanted to also acknowledge that. And you see it subtly in some pictures where there was this picture we shot by the West Side Highway. And there was a, a picture of a tree in bloom, right? And there was a runner running. So that gives you a sense of life normalcy. But the tree was surrounded by other trees that were in winter mode with no leaves. So it kind of encapsulates that sense of life in this very grim situation still. So there was a lot of balancing and a lot of thought process going into just taking snapshots out of the bike or car. So there's, there's a lot of thought process that goes into it. You know, as she was saying, we were talk every day, we would discuss from if she needed to change the lens, you know, trying to, to get more motion in the photos by slowing down the speed. But then you see the, the motorcycle is really bumpy in some places. And, you know, we were discussing all that, all that kind of stuff. Also, it couldn't be all about people with masks, okay? There is, obviously, a few pictures where people are wearing masks, and that's, that puts you immediately in the corona situation. But there is also pictures with people that, that doesn't wear masks, like the one that she's referring, or, or the one where this, this guy in, in Manhattan pushing a, a, a car and, and, and many others. We wanted to also avoid the type of postcard type of pictures. There is a lot of pictures that you can only take if you are in a highway or in a road, in a motorcycle or in a moving vehicle. The picture of the, of the Brooklyn Bridge. We had other pictures that were nicer, cleaner, that showed the, the Brooklyn Bridge in a way that was more the, the traditional one, but we chose one that where you can, you know, it's dark and you can see it sideways from a place that normally you don't see it. So, that's something that we that we wanted also to you know to avoid the cliche image, okay? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I want to summarize this part with something important that a lot of people don't know, which happens behind the scenes, is that every little detail is almost deliberate. A blurring of photos might be sometimes accidental, 
But a lot of times I was doing deliberately to not use a shutter speed that was too fast. And why? It's because you want people to have the sense that they're on a bike with you. You know, we have pictures where in the foreground, you have a little bit of the back of Enrique's helmet. It's a bit of black. And people are like, oh, why is there dead space? I mean, most people get it. It kind of puts you in the back seat with me as though you're sitting behind Enrique. So everything in there has been discussed and like kind of put in the dryer three times and sped out again, you know? And the back mirror of the motorcycle is in almost all the pieces. Yeah, I love that. I love that effect and the idea of, of again, seeing the back of your helmet or or the mirror or the rear view mirror is to, again, give you the sense that you are on that motorcycle. And that photo you had mentioned about the mm -hmm. cherry blossom tree in what is otherwise a pretty gray day with the runner in the background. That was one of the ones, and there's dozens of photos here that really stood out to me. I thought that was beautiful and really sort of captured a lonely runner is probably about as good of, of an image to capture what's going on in New York these days as anything else. I want to ask one more question, and you touched into it earlier, me, about just the sort of challenges of being a photographer um, with a story like this. You know, People staying away from each other is not the most effective way to tell a story with a camera, and there's no phone reporting for a photographer. So when it comes to covering the pandemic where you can't get close to people, you know, what are the challenges for you and other journalists and and Enrique and, and just in, in assigning your journalist stories? What are the challenges you're facing and what are the precautions that you're taking? Well, this question for me has a lot of different answers depending on what you're trying to get at. But personally, I feel like this, the, the main problem a lot of people are getting is access, you know, to covering things. And then the other, the other challenge is to cover it differently from everybody else because an ambulance is an ambulance, a hospital is a hospital, sick people are seen in a certain scenario. And also we, we then try to balance it and, and, and have the challenge of how you want to have access to go close to your subject, right? To tell the inside story, but not everyone has that access. And then there are dangers attached to it. I think we can only do our best. And this is one way to kind of be creative. For me, I don't have access to any hospitals, at least. So that's why we kind of came up with the plan of, why don't we do something where we have access to places, right? And places many places that we can get to that you can't really get to even if you're on a car. So we use that to an, our advantage and we kind of work with what we had. I think the one thing is to do your best with what you have and and try to be creative with it. I tend to get very close and I get very personal and people let me into their lives. I become a fly on the wall with a lot of the projects and the nature of the projects that I've worked on. For this, what Enrique did was he pushed me, because he's a good editor, he pushed me out of my comfort zone. There's a tendency and an instinct to go and crop your pictures and make it perfect. You know, we all, I shoot instinctively. And then later on, what I like to do is control the composition. But in this sense, he told me to embrace the fact that you have to just trust your instinct completely to capture a moment and leave it. And that's why 80% of the photos aren't cropped. And that is because we wanted to give people the sense of this being raw and stolen and not too controlled. I think that what you need to do is work within your best ability of what you have. And this was quite a reflection of that for me. And, you know, I haven't used the subway here almost never. So uh, because I always move with a motorcycle and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't know how much of the Corona has been spread in New York in the subway, but probably quite a bit. So it was a good thing too. Mei Wang and Enrique Marti, thank you so much for sharing your stories. This was a, a, quite a ride, literally and figuratively. I appreciate your work. You can find it on apnews.com. And again, the headline, it's a beautiful photo essay with some uh, a story written by Ted Anthony, and there's some video involved. Uh, the headline is Ghostly Virus Here in New York, Captured from a Motorbike, Mei Wang, Enrique Marti, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Today at APNews.com, our one good thing highlights how in a time of anxiety and isolation, simple acts of kindness from healthcare workers are giving comfort to patients and their families, whether it's playing guitar or singing, or maybe even just playing a simple game of tic-tac-toe. 
That's it for this episode of Ground Game. We'll be here every step of the way during this extraordinary moment in American politics and American life, giving you all the news you need to know. Be sure to tell a friend about us, and please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Some of the details of our discussion may have changed by the time you hear this. For up-to-date developments on all of your news, head over to apnews.com. From the Westwood One Podcast Network. 